If your pick 7 through 12 in your fantasy draft coming up at some point, August, September, whatever, ooh, we've got a good one for y'all today. I was trying to figure out, I've been doing some videos where I do drafts, right? I do full drafts, and then I look at the draft afterwards. Like, I do analysis on the draft looking back retroactively rather than doing full mock drafts with you guys or full live streams of the drafts as they're happening. We like to mix them in sometimes, but I like to do the draft so I could lock in, you know, and then go backwards and talk about my thought process as it happens. So today I was like, I want to do that. But how do I how do I add a little salt and pepper to it? How do I spice it up so that there's like a clear theme or a point of what I'm trying to do here? I went on to underdog and I joined a normal $3 draft and I'm like, cool, let's rip. Let's kind of see what comes of this. The pick I got was the 108. So I'm like, all right, cool. Maybe I'll focus on like the back half of the draft and kind of see how things play out. So that was my strategy. I was like, let me make a video based on what happens in the back half of drafts, right? So I could really narrow down like the best strategy for y'all position by position, round by round, kind of things like that. See where the value pockets are. So the first draft, I was just experimenting and the team came out like whatever. I was just trying to, you know, see pockets of value. I'm like, okay, now, now we enter a bunch of drafts and try to get some back half drafts to really see like what's going on here. So the first draft was 108. The second draft I enter, 108. I enter another one as I'm drafting to wait for another one, 108. Do it for the third time, 110. So I'm sitting there and I got three drafts in a row, 108, 108, 110. So these drafts, these teams are going to be very similar and these teams are going to have very similar strategies. So today's going to be so good because I get to break down three different drafts pretty much and how they flowed and where there might be minor differences and what you can do if those minor differences occur in a draft. If you are drafting from the seven through 12 spot, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're new, if you're prepping for your fantasy football season, hit the thumbs up button. If you enjoyed, like your traps and tuck in. So I think what we're going to do here is put each draft board up on the screen, kind of go through the thought process as the picks were happening. We'll probably only go through like the first 10 or 11 rounds of each draft, given the fact that like if you are drafting at home with your friends, family, whatever, those are like the rounds that matter. After that, there's not as much strategy as it is kind of like, you know, get your guys, stack up a bunch of high upside guys or handcuffs or do whatever the fuck you want, kickers, defenses, that kind of nonsense. So I think the strategy really matters in the beginning of drafts. Everyone was like, no, the later strategy matters. No, it doesn't. You're hitting on like fucking 4% of the players once you get to round 11 anyways. So we're sitting at the 108. As I said, I did not lie to you. I promise. That's what a liar would say. However, in the back end of the first round, you get a choice of pretty much a high-end wide receiver or a high-end running back. In my opinion, the receiver feels a little bit more comfortable to me because if you go Diggs or AJ Brown, right, or Adams, whatever you want to do, I do like Amon Ra. I do like Garrett Wilson, but those guys seem to be like a minor tear drop off from the Diggs and the A.J. Browns and those guys, right? So I like going wide receiver because anytime you're in the back half of the, the first round, you end up being able to grab an elite running back as well. I also like this spot as it pertains to these wide receivers in particular, like the actual players themselves rather than just strategy because I am someone who really wants to grab a high-end quarterback, all right? And Stefan Diggs and A.J. Brown have Jalen Hurts and Josh Allen, two of the top three fantasy QBs. And there are going to be times where you can grab them in the third round. Now, unfortunately, in any of the drafts I had this morning, I was not able to get any of those guys at the 3-8, the 310, where I was drafting from. But it kind of just like works itself out that way. You don't actually have to reach. You don't have to go above and beyond to like grab the digs or the AJ Brown because that's where they're going anyways. It just happens to be a little luxury, a little uh, you know, sprinkle on top if those guys fall to you. You grab a digs, you grab an AJ Brown, you grab your top wide receiver for some fucking reason, you know, Cooper Cup or Tyree Kill falls to you, you smash that as well. Now on the turnaround, I am starting to get more and more in love with the fact that these running backs like you have a legit top end RB1 available to you at the 2-5, at the 2-6, at the 2-2, at the 2-3, wherever you're drafting from. These guys would normally year in and year out be the dudes that were first round picks, right? JT, Chubb, Bijan. So now you're getting a top tier player at both positions. You're getting Diggs, who's a top five fantasy wide receiver. You're getting Jonathan Taylor, who's a top five fantasy running back, right? And sometimes it's Chubb that falls to you, and sometimes it's Saquon that falls to you. I think if you flip this and went the reverse way, you would be getting tier one of someone and tier two of the other position, where in this strategy, most of the time, you are going to end up getting tier one wide receiver and tier two of running back. When we get into the third round, 
like I said, I will be shooting for these elite quarterbacks, especially in one quarterback leagues, because they are difference makers now. They are averaging six, seven, eight points more per game than like the next tier of QBs, which is massive relative to like the whole late round quarterback strategy and where that's been for a while. But a lot of the time, if we're being real, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes don't fall to you there. So you're not going to be able to get your guys. And in this instance, I am normally just grabbing my wide receiver too. So you feel good about Diggs. You feel good about Amari Cooper is who I took here. And you feel good about Jonathan Taylor. So you've got three skill players at this position. And this is where things get a little tricky afterwards, I think. Well, not tricky for me, tricky for y'all. So in round four, you're in the beginning to middle-ish of round four if you're picking at the end of the first round. Unless someone super, super duper obvious falls to you here, I'm going to continuously grab Justin Fields as my QB1. I don't really care if this is a reach based on ADP. He's currently going behind Joe Burrow. He's currently like back into fourth, early fifth round pick. I'm sitting here and I want my guy. I think you're getting an elite quarterback in fantasy at a heavily discounted price. Like he is going to produce not as much as Jalen Hurts, but he's like a mini Jalen Hurts version that's going to have games where he throws up 30, 35, 40 fantasy points. I want him on all of my teams in the fourth round. So the way you can approach this is like in the fourth round, you're, if you're the back half of the first round pick, the fourth round, you could get Justin Fields pretty much every time, right? It almost always works out, especially on underdog. So if you're not on underdog yet, this is the platform that we are drafting on right now. Underdog Fantasy, the link to download is down below. Now, all of these drafts have really, really realistic and sharp, you know, drafters and people taking it seriously because every draft is a buy-in, right? So you have to pay at least $3 to draft these types of draft and you don't have to set your lineup. You don't have to do waiver wires. You don't have to make trades. You don't do sit starts, anything like that. They automatically start the best players at each position in your lineup each week and then you come back at the end of the year if you won your league you get money second place third place all gets money so you're playing fantasy without like the shitty parts of fantasy having to stay up and do waiver wire and stuff like that so i rip off like five of these a day if you throw ten dollars or more down on underdog if you're a first time depositor and you use code bdge b d g e they're going to double whatever you put down so if you throw 20 down on the platform you're a first time depositor you use bdge you're going to have 40 to play with right and then you could do 13 of these three dollar drafts and go get yourself four mcnuggets afterwards even though four mcnuggets is probably like fucking eight dollars in this damn economy point being go download the underdog app I am drafting with you guys all the time. If you're in our Discord, I drop links to these drafts for you guys to draft with us. This is the best way for you to understand trends and players within drafts. So Justin Fields for me in the fourth round, I absolutely love. I don't love any of the running backs left. I don't love any of the wide receivers. From Jerry Judy all the way down to the next round of, of like Christian Kirks, I don't see like a massive difference in value. And why I'm really, really fine not taking a running back, a second running back up to this point, right? Like getting your wide receivers, getting your quarterback of choice is because the fifth round is just juicy with running backs. Now, you can take a chance and try to see if Fields falls to you here. It happens sometimes. You know, I would say maybe a coin flip, probably less than a coin flip that Fields falls to you there. It is going to be a little bit dicey if you try to do this. But I really feel like this is a running back sweet spot. You can grab Fields, and then a lot of the time, which you'll see in other drafts, like you might have your choice of Mixon, Aaron Jones, Kenneth Walker, J.K. Dobbins, depending on if you like Miles Sanders, Alexander Madison, Damian Pierce, Cam Akers, they, like those guys, you know, again, this is more strategy based than actual like player analysis, but you'll get a choice of like some really, really good running backs in the fifth, sixth round where normally that's like the dead zone of old aging, non-explosive, like, oh, you know, like the James Conner types. Those are the guys that you normally have to draft in like the fifth round of fantasy draft, fourth, fifth round, but we've learned our lesson and now he's all the way down here going at the eight, two. Now you have the young, explosive workhorses that you're getting in the fifth, sixth round. So take advantage of those value pockets. So I went Dobbins here at the fifth, right? And again, you can replace him with anyone that went behind him. Damian Pierce, Miles Sanders, if you like those guys better, Cam Akers. And I wanted to make sure that I got a really good tight end as well. Now, this was a little bit risky. Honestly, I didn't know if Kittle was going to fall to me. Hawkinson went two picks after me. Kittle ended up falling to me at the 6-5. And now I'm thinking like, I definitely wanted Hawkinson. I definitely wanted Kittle, like one of those two. And I got him. And my team right now is extremely fucking well-rounded, right? I have two very good pass catchers, two very good running backs. I have an elite quarterback and I have a really, really solid top five tight end in George Kittle. I'm trying to tailor this video more towards people just in redraft, just doing normal leagues, but underdog is best ball, right? 
So it's taking the highest point totals each week at that position and starting that guy for you. So George Kittle should be getting way more fucking love in this uh, in this type of format. So he is like my sixth round pick every time he drops to me. So right now you have like an incredible starting lineup. Now you have like a really, really strong base of choosing where you want to go from there. Now they do start three wide receivers in underdog. So a lot of people go wide receiver heavy. I still think it's fine because you do have a flex spot. You start two running backs, you start three wide receivers, and you have a flex spot. So if you have four really solid running backs, like you could still stack up seven, eight, nine wide receivers on the back end of your roster and just hope like one of those guys hits on a weekly basis. But if you're playing in a league where you start two wide receivers only and then a flex, or if it's just half PPR like underdog is, I wouldn't overvalue the wide receiver position like I am towing the line here. So I ended up taking Rashad White because I'm looking around in the seventh round and I'm like, okay, there are Rashad Whites, there's Pacheco's, there's Dave Montgomery's that are going off the board, whatever. Those are the running backs relative to like Gabe Davis, uh, Gabe Davis, Kadarius Tony, Addison. Like realistically, those running backs, think of the running backs there, right? Rashad White, Cam Akers went, you know, five picks before, whatever, Pacheco, David Montgomery. Those guys all have upside of being like workhorse running backs or scoring double digit touchdowns. Whereas the other guys around him, like Gabe Davis to pick behind me, I don't know what, what's a good season look like for Davis at this point right now, like 900 yards and six touchdowns. I, I don't know. I'd rather take the upside of what a running back offers in this middle round as well. I just, I, I kind of feel like there's a drop off of wide receiver value in these middle rounds. So I want to get them a little bit earlier, but still kind of like diversify my roster next round i took brandon cooks he was just a wide receiver i wanted i would have taken bateman if he was available there but now we get our third wide receiver i'm not gonna lie the aj Dillon pick was actually an auto pick i went to the bathroom when i was in uh, the cafe that i was at while i was doing these drafts i would have taken let's just say i would have taken alvin kamara over aj Dillon, but whatever we took a running back there and then i took sky Moore in the next round so we're looking at four wide receivers we're looking at four running backs we have our starting tight end we have our starting quarterback through 10 rounds and i would feel fucking fantastic about this team are we a little light on maybe the wide receiver three yes possibly but you could usually find wide receivers on the waiver wire throughout the fantasy season especially the wide receiver three spot if you're lacking wide receiver one and two you might have some trouble but wide receiver three that guy's going to average i don't know eight points per game anyways you will be able to find that on the waiver wire so i feel like this strategy worked really really well where back into the first round you're taking a high-end wide receiver and obviously you don't want to go through every draft and be like i know exactly what position i'm taking in every single round but from what I've found from the number of drafts that I've done on underdog and the number of mock drafts that I've done, et cetera, throughout the summer so far, these are where like the very, very obvious value pockets to me so far are standing out. And it's the high end wide receiver. It's the high end running back because those running backs, the RB ones that you're finding in the second round are normally always first round picks in fantasy football. This year, we're swinging more towards wide receivers. It was because we had a down year in the running back position. The last time this happened, that was like when Devonta Freeman was the RB one back in 2015. He averaged like 18 and a half points per game as the RB1, which is a really low normal number for the RB1 of a fantasy season. The next year, everyone was drafting wide receivers and then running backs won every single league. This happening again this year, last year, like the RB1 averaged like 18.6 points per game. It's the same cycle happening again. So do not let these like running backs pass you by for a mid-tier wide receiver two when you're getting the Saquon, Pollard, JT, those kind of guys in the second round. I'll grab my second pass catcher here if I can't get an elite quarterback. And if I don't, that's fine because we get our elite quarterback here. We get our choice of running backs here. We get our elite tight end here. And then you kind of just mix and match with skill players there. Let me put the second draft up on the screen now. Okay, so I'm I'm like I'm so fucking happy that I got to do multiple of these because a lot of times you'll do like a mock draft and then people will be like, ah, it's not realistic. That shit never happens. But this was the next draft. I started with Diggs again. Again, I could have went with AJ Brown. Didn't really matter. Again, the point of this video is more strategy. So I went with the elite wide receiver and I also got JT again. So I got another elite running back. This time, Jalen Hurst, Josh Allen, again, went 3-3, 3-4. So I wasn't able to get him. Amari Cooper went before DK Metcalf. So I got Metcalf as my wide receiver, two in the third round. Felt really good about it. And I pulled the trigger on Justin Fields again because I was able to get Aaron Jones at the 5-8, man. Like, that is a thing of beauty. Would you rather have Aaron Jones or, like, Deontay Johnson, who just had a zero touchdown, like, 800-yard season? I get it. Like, I might, I, I even kind of like him for, like, a bounce back here, and he's a cool, like, wide receiver three, half PPR, wide receiver two, and full PPR. But, like, over Aaron Jones and, and Mixon and J.K. Dobbins just doesn't really make sense to me at all 
relative to like how fantasy has always been played. Now, this is kind of the shitty part about this is I really wanted to wait on tight end to grab George Kittle. Unfortunately, I should have probably known that George Kittle ended up going off the board at the 512. What I was thinking about was like, okay, maybe I just grab Kittle here to make sure I lock him up and I'll just get one of those running backs afterwards. I'm really glad I didn't do that because if you swap George Kittle with Aaron Jones, you basically had six of the top running backs left. Any of the guys that I would have wanted to take at that spot had gone off the board before I got back to my pick. And I would have just basically swapped George Kittle for Aaron Jones in my lineup and probably been left with Chris Godwin there. Now, I mean, some of you guys might have problems with Godwin. I think he'll be fine. I think him and Evans are going to have a monster target share there in Tampa Bay. They're like the only thing in that passing offense. Anyways, now we get to the seventh round. And this was another one where I really wanted Goddard. Right. If I miss on George Kittle in the sixth, then I will be targeting Dallas Goddard in the seventh. He went one pick before I was able to pick, which was unfortunate. But again, James Conner, like the upside of him being a workhorse, I, I don't think he has like a ceiling upside, but there's still a very, very good chance that he has 240, 250 touches, scores six to seven touchdowns. And I'd rather that over like the hope that Gabe Davis actually isn't bad at football kind of thing, you know? So at this point, we have our QB1 in fields. We have three, in my opinion, really solid receivers in Diggs, Metcalf, Godwin, and you have three really solid running backs in Jonathan Taylor, Aaron Jones, James Conner. Now, I only took the screenshot up to the 11th round, so I don't actually remember what I did with tight end. I believe I grabbed Dalton Kincaid in the 12th and then Cole Komet in the 13th or 14th to pair up with Justin Fields there. So if you do end up missing on the tight ends there. Sometimes it's best to wait. If you have a strong opinion on like Ingram and Joku, Pat Fryermuth, whoever those guys are, then then go for it, right? I don't I don't think there's going to be much of a difference between those guys. If you have the quarterback, then maybe you want to stack them and put a little bit more priority on that. Cool, whatever. But realistically, what I'm trying to do is grab Hawkinson in the fifth if he falls to me, Kittle in the sixth if he falls to me, and Goddard in the seventh if he falls to me. That's probably my takeaway with tight end position as it stands. But I felt really good about this team right here. Uh, people who are like obsessed with underdog, who play underdog all the time, will probably tell you that this is not enough wide receivers. But I promise uh, the pendulum has swung just too fucking far as it relates to wide receivers this offseason. Now let's now we can move to draft number three, where I was drafting from the 110 immediately afterwards. Okay, so same thing happened. AJ Brown went one round before me, uh, one pick before me. I got digs at the 110, and then I got to pair him up with Nick Chubb there at the 2 3. So you got a wide receiver one. You got a running back one. I was able to get Metcalf again. I was able to get Fields in the fourth. I was able to get Kittle in the fifth. I was able to get Miles Sanders in the sixth. Like you're seeing a very clear pattern here. Now, I did take Kittle in the fifth, you'll see. And I allowed the risk of maybe not getting a running back to get back to me. However, I was looking at the teams that were already drafted. And most people don't go running back heavy whatsoever in underdog drafts. And knowing that both of the teams after me had already drafted two running backs each up to this point, I didn't think that at least both of them weren't going to weren't going to go with another running back. Turns out neither of them went with a single running back there. So that was a good read on my part. And I took Miles Sanders there. But again, the point was not about like Miles Sanders being the guy that I loved. I could have gotten Miles Sanders or Damian Pierce or Cam Akers and been happy knowing that there was four picks before my next turn. And there was three running backs that I really liked with two guys that already took two running backs. So again, you basically just saw three drafts in a row with this exact strategy coming off exactly how I wanted it to happen. And this was not planned. This was not like scripted. I did all these fucking drafts this morning on underdog. So you guys should get an underdog. I'm, I promise you it is the best way to prep for your fantasy drafts this summer with shit like this, understanding the value pockets. We are going to do this same exact video for the one through six spot probably next Monday. But after Miles Sanders, I wanted to you know start pounding out the wide receivers because I felt good about my top two running backs, Quentin Johnson, Rashad Bateman. I took Jameson Williams in the 10th round, Romeo Dobbs in the 11th round, et cetera, et cetera. But again, I, I think strategy is important when you are like starting to pick your starting lineup and it's at the top half of the drafts and things like that. So we ran through three drafts today on underdog, all paid drafts, all $3 entry, all whatever it is. I don't know, $30 to the winner, $25 to the winner, something to the second, third, you know how the math adds up. The best math is that if you go on underdog and you use promo code BDGE, if it's your first time depositing $10 all the way up to $100, they will match that on your account. Do two drafts a week. You could do slow drafts where they're eight hours between picks and just sign up for like five of them. And every 30 minutes or so, you will be uh, getting hit with a notification saying you're on the clock. Go look back at your draft board and see where you could have improved, where you could have targeted other guys, etc. Um, I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, subscribe to the channel. If you're new to the channel, and hit the thumbs up button.
if you enjoyed a video like this, if you want me to make one through six. All right, I'm out of here. I love y'all.